So uh, our first speaker today is uh, Yasu Hiraoka from Kyoto University. And the title of his today's talk is on characterizing rare events in persistent homology. Yasu, the screen is yours. Hey, uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, I'm Yasu Hiraoka from Kyoto and uh, well, uh, thank you very much for all the organizers for giving me opportunity uh, of this talk. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> well, uh, this is the title of my talk. And uh, before starting the talk, uh, well, <clears throat> Let me first explain the motivation uh, of this work, why I am interested in rare events in persistent homology. But at this moment, when you hear rare events, you may think that um, rare events are not interesting objects to study. But uh, as I, I, I will explain soon, characterizing rare events will be very important to make multi-parameter persistent homology easier to handle. Uh, okay, <clears throat> uh, wait a moment, there is a bit technical problem. Okay, <clears throat> all right, so here, here is the uh, content of my talk. So my final goal is to understand multi-parameter persistent homology and uh, make it easier to handle for practical data analysis. So this is my final goal. And uh, I have not yet achieved this goal at present, but uh, I will talk several ongoing works uh, to this goal. Uh, first of all, I'd like to show a strong motivation from practical data analysis in material science, and then make the mathematical problem clear. Uh, here, I will show how rare events appear in multi-parameter persistent tomology in materials DDA. And for this exposition, I need similar mathematical formulation using quiver representation. So uh, I will also give a brief review about some of the basics about quiver representation and uh, in particular, uh, commutative ladder persistence. And uh, the, our basic message in section one here is that Although multi-parameter persistent tomology is extremely difficult to handle in purely algebraic setting, some geometric constraints of data like point clouds in Euclidean space maybe reduce the algebraic complexity of multi-parameter persistent tomology. So this is uh, my basic question. And then after formulating a mathematical target in representation theory way, we consider this problem in random topology way in section two. For this purpose, I will first review my previous works about several limit theorems in one parameter persistence, uh, namely low of large numbers, uh, central limit theorems of the Betty numbers and uh, even uh, persistence diagrams, low of large numbers of the persistence diagrams. Then I will show some recent results about large deviation principle, LDP, of one parameter persistence. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, the large division principle clarifies rare events in random variables. And these results are necessary to discuss our final goal, since we are interested in rare events. And finally, I will show a low large number in two parameter persistent homology, which partially answers to our original questions. So this is the content of my talk. Uh, all right. Uh, okay, so let me explain a motivation of today's mathematical talk from materials TDA projects. I have been uh, recently working on materials TDA, and these are some examples to which I have applied TDA so far. Uh, these researches are mainly supported by AIMR in Tohoku University these research grants in Japan and uh, several companies in Japan. Yeah, in Japan. And uh, well, through these researches, uh, we found that persistent homology is a really powerful tool to characterize hierarchical structures in complex materials like glass, polymers, and uh, recently uh, battery materials, etc. However, in these applications, uh, there are several 
or we can say many opportunities where we actually need multi-parameter persistent homology for more, how to say, detailed characterizations of material structures. And uh, well, uh, in order to make clear this point, uh, let me explain one of the representative works about materials TDA. So in order to see how multi-parameter persistent homology is really necessary to understand more detailed material structures. Okay, uh, this is a, in a sense, most starting work in our material CDA project. Uh, although this is a bit old work, uh, let me briefly explain, uh, let me briefly explain it in order to clarify the motivation of today's mathematical part. Uh, this is a joint work with these people, Emerson Escara, uh, Professor Nishiura, and so on. And uh, well, in this work, we are interested in finding hidden geometric structures only embedded in a glass state. Uh, here, uh, the left three panels show the atomic configurations of materials silica, SiO2, silicon atoms, and then oxygen atoms in crystal state, in glass state, and then in liquid state. And uh, here, as we see, it is easy to distinguish the crystal state from its periodic structures, periodicities, because of the crystal structures. So it's easy to distinguish crystal. However, uh, it is not so easy to distinguish between glass and liquid states by just looking at those atomic configurations. Uh, actually, uh, both look just randomly distributed. It looks randomly distributed. Uh, however, as you know, glass, material glass, is a rigid material, and uh, it means that there must exist some geometric constraints inducing its rigidity. And this is the target which we would like to find in this project. And to that aim, we applied persistent homology to, to those atomic configurations. Uh, well, the light three panels show the persistence diagrams of dimension one of the left respectively computed by alpha filtrations. It means that uh, so to each point, so here each point corresponds to silicon atom or atom, uh, oxygen atom. And, it, and uh, on each point, we add a ball and uh, we increase the radius from very small to very large and construct the alpha filtrations. And those are the persistence diagrams computed on that model in dimension one. The, as we see, uh, now we can clearly distinguish the glass state from the liquid state by the presence of these curves. Only in the glass state, we can observe the curves here. <clears throat> Actually, uh, we can show by using the inverse analysis of basis entomology that this specific, but this, this specific vertical curve is very important uh, to characterize the geometric structures of the glass. Uh, today, uh, because of the time limitation, I will skip those details from the material science viewpoint here, but uh, please remember that this vertical curve or line, generators of lines of, lines of generators, <clears throat> is very important to characterize the geometric structures of the glass. So please remember that. And now I'd like to gradually move on to the mathematical motivation based on this uh, observation. Okay, uh, this is the same persistence diagram of the silica glass as I shown in the last slide, previous slide. And uh, our next interesting question in material science is to study the robustness of this vertical curve. Since this vertical curve characterizes an important geometric structure of silica glass, the robustness of this curve with respect to perturbation directly relates to the rigidity of the material. So uh, we generated a perturbed configuration from the original one by adding a small pressure to it. And this is the persistence diagram of the perturbed atomic configuration. 
Well, uh, it looks very similar because the added perturbation is very small, but they are actually different. And now we are interested in studying the robustness, or I would say persistence between these two curves in the green regions, left generators and then right generators. We are interested in persistence between them with respect to perturbations. Uh, let me formulate the robustness problem in a mathematical way. Uh, let X be the check complex or the alpha complex for the computational purpose, but uh, it's the same. Let X be the check complex for the left atomic configuration and the Y be the light check complex for the light configuration. Here, uh, alpha here means the uh, radius parameter. And now uh, let us note that these vertical curves can be characterized by the generators of persistence diagrams whose birth radius is smaller than R and this radius is larger than S. So, uh, and then the same is true in the, <clears throat> like even in the light figures. So let's consider the following commutative diagram of homology at parameter R and then S. So we take X here and then we take Y here and the R on the bottom and the S on the top. Let's consider this commutative diagram. Then as we see, the each left generator in the green box can be expressed by the length to interval in the vertical direction. Since uh, it's, it's burst time for each generator, its burst time is less than R, less than R, and its death time is greater than S. So such a generator should be expressed by length to interval in vertical direction in this way. Here K means our base field and the N here means the number of generators in this left uh, green box. Similarly, uh, each generator in the light box can also be expressed by the length to interval like this. And the M here means the number of generators in the green box. So under this setting, the robustness problem of these two vertical curves can be formulated to study the persistence of these interval representations in the left and then right in this diagram. So we would like to study the persistence of left generator and the right generator in this diagram. However, as you know, uh, this is not the standard setting of persistent homology where we conventionally consider the linearly filtered setting in the conventional persistent homology. So uh, we need to, uh, so uh, how to say, we need more general framework to deal with this persistence. And uh, actually this will be studied by multi-parameter persistent homology. And uh, let me briefly explain some of the backgrounds here. Uh, as you know, uh, the standard persistent homology is defined by taking homology to a linearly arranged filtration like this. So it can be regarded as a representation on N quiver. Then the Gabriel theorem on N type uh, states that we have a unique decomposition of the persistent homology into the direct sum of interval representations and the persistence diagram is defined by the multi-set given by the buses pairs appearing in this decomposition. So for instance, given the atomic configuration of glass, we can compute the persistence diagram by this way. So this is a standard uh, persistent homology. And uh, in the multi-parameter persistent homology, uh, we do not consider only linear filtrations, but study filtrations induced from high dimension lattice uh, like this. This is a, this is a two parameter case. And uh, well, uh, there are actually many mathematical researches of this subject. Uh, however, it is still very difficult to handle them in purely algebraic settings, even now, I think. And uh, here I'd like to remark that a research group in Japan Asashiba, Nakashima, Emerson Eskala, and their collaborators 
recently introduced an interesting concept called interval approximation in multi-parameter sense. You can find several papers from archive <coughs> like uh, in 2018 and 2019, two papers at least you can find. Well, actually they defined intervals in multi-parameter sense, and they study the composability of two parameter persistence modules by using only intervals. And they also give an explicit method to approximate the given module by the direct sum of those intervals. Uh, well, uh, the meaning of approximation is not yet clear, is not yet clear, and uh, interval decomposition, which they presented, is understood as a, say, formal Grotandi group. So interval decomposition in their way can be regarded as a formal Grotandi group, namely, it may have negative summand. So in that sense, uh, we need to further study this idea more. So we need to brush up, brush up more uh, their uh, results uh, for the practical applications. But uh, I think this is a very interesting future direction to study multi-parameter persistence. And uh, actually, as we see shortly, uh, today's my work is also related to this idea, interval approximation. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Emerson Escara and uh, I have studied a restricted version of two-parameter persistence uh, several years ago in such a way that the vertical length is said to be two, uh, like this. We called it commutative ladder persistence and study its mathematical structure by applying the so-called auslander lighten theory. Although it is restricted to length two in vertical direction, we found that it is very useful in several problems in material science. And then now, actually, uh, as we see, our robustness problem explained in several slides ago uh, can be regarded as a representation on the length three ladder. So n is taken to be three to model this uh, commutative ladder. <clears throat> Actually, uh, we can show that the commutative ladder of length three of these <coughs> directions, uh, we can show that uh, this algebra is a representation finite, uh, meaning that we can list all the isomorphism classes of indecomposables, and they are here listed as, um, as the Auslander Leighton quiver. Here, each vertex, each vertex, corresponds to an indecomposable expressed as the dimension vector. For example, uh, 121010, this is uh, sitting here. Uh, 121010 means that we have one dimensional vector space here, 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 corresponding to the location of the one. And we have two dimensional vector space here, corresponding to this two and zero otherwise. So this is a, a expression of the dimension vector. And uh, since they are all the list of indecomposables appearing in this algebra, uh, we can define the persistence diagram as a function assigning multiplicities on each vertex. And this actually generalizes the uh, uh, classical concept of the persistence diagram in multi-parameter way. All right, uh, now let us go back to the robustness problem in silica glass. Uh, okay, <clears throat> as I explained, <clears throat> we are studying a uh, commutative ladder persistence on the length three, like this. This is our mathematical target to study robustness problem in silica glass. And our interest is to study the persistence of vertical intervals, left one and right one. Namely, in this formulation, the robustness can be measured by counting the multiplicity of this specific indecomposable. So uh, let's compute the persistence diagram of this uh, persistence diagram to this data. And uh, here is the result applied to the real materials data. It may be small, but uh, here, uh, 
one, 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 one. This is our interest corresponding to this in the composable. And the multiplicity of this vertex is given by this number. So uh, by taking, uh, for instance, a ratio to the total generators, we can show that the persistence of the vertical generator between left and right is about, uh, how do you say, 99% uh, of generators persist under pressurizations by uh, taking a ratio of this number to the total generators. So in this way, uh, we can quantitatively uh, characterize the robustness problem under pressurization by using uh, commutative ladder persistence. So this is one of the application of multi-parameter persistent homology in material science. All right, uh, from now, uh, let's focus on these pink generators. Previously, we are interested in this generator, but uh, let's consider these two pink generators. Here, uh, these indecomposables the, in the are called non-intervals, and all the others are classified as interval representation in two-parameter sense given by the work of Asashiba. In the previous result of silica glass, those multiplicities are very small numbers. This corresponds to zero, and then this corresponds to one, so very small numbers comparing to the others. And uh, actually, at first, I didn't care about this result since I focused on the multiplicity of the indecomposable of this type. So we are interested only this multiplicities. So we didn't care about those numbers, zero and one for no intervals. But then later I started to care about the frequency of those no intervals in more general settings. So uh, in order to check how frequent this observation is, we numerically generated many random point process, random point clouds in the Euclidean space and computed those persistence diagrams. Uh, here, uh, we generated random point process denoted by phi. So we distributed random point in a space, three-dimensional space, and it's that is denoted by phi. And uh, we constructed its sinning process, which is denoted by phi prime. So sinning means that uh, we randomly remove some of the points from phi, and that is denoted by phi prime. So we have an inclusion from phi prime to phi because, because of the sinning, and we arranged phi prime and then phi to the vertical way like this. This is the check phi prime, check uh, of phi. And uh, <clears throat> for the horizontal direction, we use radius parameters as usual. So we can construct the assistant homology in, uh, on the commutative ladder, two by three commutative ladder by using these uh, parameters. And uh, uh, we computed persistence diagrams of this commutative ladder many times and observed interesting phenomena. Uh, actually, <coughs> non-interval indecomposables non rarely appeared. For instance, this is one of the result. This one is zero and this one is also zero. So uh, these numerical experiments may imply the following question, this question. Under random effect in the Euclidean space, do non-intervals rarely appear in multi-parameter persistent homology? So this is a basic question suggested from this observation. If the answer is yes, it justifies the meaning of interval approximation by Asashiba. And under a certain setting where no intervals do not appear in probabilistic sense, it suffices to consider interval decomposition even in multi-parameter persistence. Of course, interval decompositions are much easier to handle comparing to the purely algebraic setting, original setting of the multi-parameter persistent homology. So this is, this is the motivation, main motivation of my recent mathematical works. And to this question, my approach is to combine the probability theory, especially random topology and uh, representation theory, which I explained so far. 
And today I will talk about several aspects relating to this question. How rare those non-intervals are? Well, uh, here is the content of the remaining part. Uh, before starting the two-parameter setting, so two-parameter setting is my mm, our original interest, but um, before that, I need to build a necessary framework in one parameter case. So in number one, I will briefly review my previous work on limit theorems of persistence diagrams in one parameter case, low large number and then central limit theorem. Then I will show our recent results about the large division principle, LDP, in one parameter persistence diagrams. Here, uh, roughly speaking, large division principles enable us to study rare events of random variables, like uh, no intervals, which we observed in the numerical results. And then finally, I will show some ongoing works on the law of large numbers for two-parameter persistent homology, which is our original interest. Which, and then this result uh, tells us a partial answer to the previous question about the rare event of no intervals in numerical experiments. Number one and number two are the collaborations with uh, my postdoc, Kanazawa-kun, and my PhD student, Miyanaga-kun, and uh, Tsunoda-san. And number three is a collaboration with my PhD student, Shimizu-kun. Okay, uh, now we finished the part one. And uh, uh, okay, uh, uh, I'd like to move on to the part two. All right, uh, from now on, let me explain several results about limit theorems in persistent homology in a random topology way. And for the sake of simplicity, uh, today I focus on the cubical setting like this. Uh, well, uh, our original interest or numerical observations are based on the random point process, not a cubical setting, but uh, most of the results explained here using cubical uh, complex can be translated to the setting of the random point process. And for the sake of simplicity, I'd like to use cubical set uh, in this talk to explain the main result. Yeah. Okay, let's start the part, uh, part two. All right, uh, here, uh, let me first explain our setting. I will study cubical sets uh, constructed by elementary tubes in D-dimensional space. Basically, I will follow the notations uh, given by the Marian and Constantine and the uh, uh, book, uh, Cubical Homology, I think, from Springer. Yeah, I will study cubical sets constructed by elementary tubes in D-dimensional space. Here, an elementary tube denoted by Q here is denoted, defined, sorry, it's defined by a product of D intervals with I'm unit lengths. The conference, but, uh, I will, uh... How did the talk go? Yeah, yeah, very well. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I try to explain cubical, uh, elementary tube, sorry. <laughs> elementary tube is <clears throat> defined by the product of D intervals with unit lengths or length zero on the integer lattice. And uh, we denote by K to the D, the set of all elementary tubes in RD. In my talk, D always means the dimension of the <clears throat> uh, background space. Then, our configuration space big omega is given by the product space of the unit intervals from zero to one over all elementary tubes. And so each configuration small omega is defined by assigning a value from zero to one on each elementary tube, like this figure. For instance, 0 0.7 is assigned to this two cell, 0 0.8 is assigned to this one cell and so on. And uh, then we assign a probability measure on this configuration space, omega and uh, f. f is a uh, sigma algebra generated by a cylinder set. 
<clears throat> and uh, in my talk, uh, we simply consider a product measure for this probability, pro probability measure. So you can, for instance, simply think that uh, each number from zero to one is uniformly distributed uh, from the unit, unit interval, and we take the product of them for each uh, elementary tube independently. All right, so this is a setting. And uh, this preparation, our random cubical set is given for each small omega and for each time t as a collection of all elementary cubes whose assigned value are less than or equal to t. So it is given as a sublevel set with respect to time t. Here, the randomness on small omega given from this p will induce the randomness on this uh, cubical set. And from this definition, <clears throat> the random cubical set xt will be an infinite set. And so we will introduce a finite cubical set by restricting the original cubical set into the window lambda n with length to n, like this figure. So uh, I will always use superscript n expressing the finite uh, restrictions restricted by the window lambda n with length to n. And furthermore, uh, by changing the threshold of time t, we naturally get the random filtration of cubical sets like this. So this is a setting of our random cubical set. And on this setting, <clears throat> on this setting, uh, first we can show the low of large numbers for beta numbers. Let beta n q is the choose beta number of the restricted cubical set by the window at uh, restricted cubical set by the window lambda n at time t. Uh, here, uh, let me recall that n means the length of the window for the restriction. And then for each time t and then q, there exists a random, uh, sorry, there exists a non-random constant. This is non-random deterministic constant, uh, beta hat, such that the restricted beta number normalized by the volume of the window converges to this constant as n goes to infinity almost surely. Namely, uh, this theorem clarifies the averaging behavior of the Betty numbers with respect to the uh, spatial, spatial structures. And uh, it also shows, the, shows that the volume of the window, so this is the volume, the vague volume of the window, is the appropriate scaling factor to observe this limiting behavior. So this is the law of large numbers. All right, uh, in today's talk, I will not use the following results, but uh, for reference, I just showed that the central limit theorem also holds even in this setting. So we can observe the convergence to the normal distribution by taking the scaling one over two. And the next, uh, by combining this result with random measure theory, we can generalize it into the low large numbers for persistence diagrams. Uh, first of all, I would like to regard, I will regard a persistence diagram as a counting measure defined over the triangular region delta. So as you know, or as I explained, persistence diagram is a multi-set on delta. So for each generator, we assign a Dirac measure. So multi-set can be regarded as a, as, sum, as a sum of the Dirac measures, which is called a counting measure. And since we are dealing with a random filtration, our persistence diagram will be a random variable. It means that our counting measure will be random variable. This is called a random point process on Delta. So I, yeah, so, in this setting, I would like to use the point, the notation, how to say, terminology point process to express the persistence diagram. I will use 
this convention in my talk. So let C be the point process on delta corresponding to the Q spacey sense diagram of the random filtration Xn. Then there exists a unique random measure nu on delta. This is a measure on delta such that the restricted passive sense diagram, restricted passive sense diagram normalized by the volume of the window converge to this random measure as n goes to infinity, almost surely. Here, let me recall that n, showing, n is showing the uh, length of the window. So uh, this theorem shows the averaging behavior of the persistence diagrams with the volume as its scaling factor. Now here is a sketch of the proof. The first item is already explained. We will regard persistence diagrams as random point process on delta. And second, uh, we extend the low large number in so in the previous slide, I showed the low large number of the Betty numbers, but now we can easily extend that result into the low large number of the persistent Betty numbers corresponding to the number corresponding to counting the number of generators of the left top regions specified by the point. And from that result, we can also show the low large numbers for the multiplicities of the rectangular regions of delta by taking the alternating sum. So at this moment, we obtain an assignment of a value for each rectangular region on delta. So what we have to do now is to explicitly construct a measure which is consistent to those assigned values on rectangles. And for that purpose, we apply random measure theory. And finally, we obtain the measure on delta corresponding to new here in the theorem. So this is a rough sketch of the low range number of the persistence diagram. And basically, the proof is almost the same as the original result with Shirai-san and Dewey-san, Trink and Dewey. All right, uh, so far I explained. Hello. So far, I explained low branch numbers for bet numbers and then persistence diagrams. And now let me explain about the large division principles. Uh, first of all, let me briefly explain the large division principle, LDP for short. Uh, let S be a topological space and uh, Xn be a sequence of random variables taking values on S. And let I be a lower semi-continuous function from S to the real. Then uh, we say that the random variables xn satisfy the large division principle with the let function i if and only if these inequalities are satisfied for any open set O and any closed set F. This is the definition. Uh, well, uh, from these inequalities, especially by changing formulation from localism to exponential, we see that LDP characterizes exponential decay properties of the probability. So by, by moving n to here and then changing log to exponential, we see that basically LDP is characterizing the exponential decay property of the probability. And this is the reason why LDP can study layer events of random variables. All right, uh, now let us move on to our recent result about the large division principles. This is a joint work with Kanazawa, Miyanaga, and Natsunoda. Under the same setting so far, we can show that the Betty numbers satisfy the large division principle with the late function i star derived from the Lugendo transformation of the function i described here. <clears throat> uh, here, e means expectation of this random variable. Well, the rate function may look complicated, but you don't need to remember it, actually. Uh, there are several remarks. First, now three fundamental theorems in probability theory, namely low large number, central limit theorem, and large division principle are completed. And as a result, various limiting behaviors can be now discussed. In particular, by using this result, 
we can study their events away from the average from this estimate, which is explained in the definition part of the LDP in the last slide. And as a final remark, we can generalize this result into persistent bet numbers, not only bet numbers, but also persistent bet numbers and also multiplicities on rectangular regions in Delta as before. Then, as before, we are now generalizing this result on the setting of persistence diagrams. And let me explain what we have done, what we have done so far. The basic idea is to prove large division principles on a projective limit space first, which I will explain now, and then induce LDP for persistence diagrams from it. So let me first explain the projective limit used here. For each L, we consider a grid decomposition of delta with length 1 over, two, 1 over 2 to the L, like this. Then for each L, VL be a finite dimensional vector space spanned by Lebesgue measures on these grids. For each grid, we assign Lebesgue measures. This is a finite dimensional space. And from, v, from L plus 1 to L, we define a linear map by this way. It means that uh, it is just a flattening the measure on the pink grid to that on the green containing the pink grid. And we have one over four because each cell is uh, split it into four cells. Then we can easily see that this sequence defines the projective limit. And now I can explain a sketch of the proof for the LDP of persistent diagrams. First, we show LDP for each VL by applying LDP for rectangles. This is a straightforward almost read. Then LDP for each VL can be lifted to this projective limit space by applying the so-called dawson gartner theorem. Hmm. However, uh, this projective limit space is too large comparing to the finite Borel measure, which was obtained as a limiting object of the law of large number for persistence diagrams. Therefore, we, or by restricting the projective limit space to the set of finite Borel measures, we can induce desired LDP. And this is a sketch of the proof for LDP of persistence diagrams. And now we are finalizing several technical parts in the last step. Okay, so this is the final slide of my talk. Up to now, I explained limit theorems in one parameter persistent homology, but here let me explain an ongoing work about limit theorem of, of two parameter persistent homology. This is a joint work with my student Shimizu, and here I go back to the original motivation explained at the beginning of my talk. As I mentioned, some computational experiments about commutative ladder persistence based on random point processes implied that non-interval intercomposables rarely appeared. I am interested in this phenomena and we obtained the following results so far. First, we can show the low large number for each intercomposables appearing in this algebra. Here, di means the multiplicity of the indecomposable i. And then this part can be done almost similar arguments explained today. But uh, I'd like to emphasize that we can also show this. Namely, limiting multiplicities for non-intervals will vanish in subcritical regime. Here, you can simply imagine a subcritical sub point process to be a sparse random point cloud. At this moment, I cannot remove the assumption of subcriticality on the point process, but this result positively explains the previous numerical observation. So in the large scale limit, we cannot observe the non-interval indecomposables. Conversely speaking, it implies the significance of the concept of interval decompositions, even in a two-parameter setting. I need to remark that uh, these results depend on our geometric setting given by point clouds in the Euclidean space. And of course, I'm not saying a similar statement for any representations of multi-parameter persistence in purely algebraic sense. I'm not saying so, but this result suggests that under suitable geometric setting, like um, practical data from Euclidean space, the algebraic structure, algebraic structure may be simplified and the interval decompositions may be one candidate even in multi-parameter setting. All right, uh, this is the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thank you very much, Yasu, for a very interesting talk. So we have time for questions now. Let's continue the same scheme, uh, just uh, use chat to put a queue and then I'll uh, ask uh, for saying the question. Uh, for the moment, I see no queue yet. Uh, if you could, Yasu, uh, explain to me, uh, I see that these uh, non-interval elements in this Auslander Reiten uh, collection of non-decomposables are distinguished by the presence of number two. Mm. But is there a more precise definition what is interval, uh, non-interval element? Uh, that here? is one necessary condition to define intervals. So precise definition of the interval is that, uh, first of all, uh, support of the representations, it means that uh, the place of the non-zero part should be convex and uh, connected. Here, convexity is in the sense of the directed graph. And also the dimension vector should be one, as, I'm, as you mentioned. And also the morphisms between one to one should be identity. So this is a uh, precise definition of the intervals. And uh, this is actually a natural generalization from the standard uh, one parameter persistence. I see. Thanks. Okay, so maybe uh, Kellen, please ask the question, Kellen Sha. Yeah, thank you. So this is a very interesting talk. So I'm wondering for your the first part about the material side. So that you show that there's a grass state and different state, and that one is from molecular dynamic simulation, right? Mm. You are talking this part, and the question uh, is yes, yes. Sorry, can you say uh, your question this, again? Uh, is this data from the molecular dynamic simulation or you obtained from something like an experiment environment? Uh, in this paper, we only use uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulations. But uh, in our recent work, we are combining MD and uh, also experimental data to fit more practical, to have a more practical configuration. Both are possible. Mm, I see. Yes, uh, we are very interested in that because uh, I know uh, in the materials they have a lot of like uh, symmetric structures. Mm -hmm. Usually, they take certain like a super cell and then generate like the two D what they call two D three D basically the, the symmetric, symmetric in different direction. Like how you take care of this kind of you know a symmetric information and uh, do you like take a, you you have a, like a general super cell that you can use uh, in your simulation or in your uh, calculation. Actually, I'm not quite sure about what the supercell means, but in our setting, uh, one of the experimental data which are used in this uh, in this research is that uh, we use the how to say uh, pair uh, pairwise distribution functions, which mm -hmm. is obtained from the diffraction patterns of the experiments. Such a data can mm -hmm. be uh, used to tune up, tune or imp improve the atomic configurations to reflect the, such kind of diffraction patterns. After such modifications, we apply the persistent tomology. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. And also for your picture, sorry for many questions. So for your picture, you said that the, the, the part is very important. And uh, I just want to figure out this one is the fatty one. Well, fatty one right? yeah. And why that region is of great importance for, for you to consider? Your, your question is why Betty one, not Betty uh, uh, Yeah, I think in your later slides, you have zoomed out a particular region, right? Like uh, I uh -huh. said that this special region is your, yes, here, here, right, mm -hmm. yeah. You said this region is of great importance uh, for your, you know, situation, something like that, right, yeah. Why, why you want to you know, particularly focus uh, on this region here? Yeah. Uh, this is actually related to the materials part, which I uh, totally skipped today, sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. As you see, we roughly see three curves, one curve here and the one curve here and the one curve here. Mm -hmm. And actually by using the inverse analysis, we can show that these curves, these two curves named by CO and the CT mm -hmm. are actually induced from CP. In that sense, this is the most primary part. And then these two parts are generated from CP. Mm. In that sense, this is actually controlling the global geometric structures of the glass state. That's why we only focus on primary part. 
to study the robustness of the grass structures. I see. I see. Is it possible to have some better two analysis on these things, or is there's no yeah. pattern for better two? Actually, this research is based on the silica glass, and the silica mm -hmm. glass is known as a network forming type glass. That's why we are interested in Betty one link mm -hmm. structure. But um, for instance, in a metallic glass, for instance, it mm -hmm. is called metallic glass. That kind of materials or glass are composed from the uh, in a, uh, basically patting patting structures, not a network mm -hmm. forming structure, but a patting structures. Mm -hmm. In such a case, uh, Betty two will be very important. And uh, we actually did several work uh, in this paper. Mm -hmm. Here, actually, this is showing the Betty 2 uh, persistence diagram in dimension 2, not in dimension 1. OK, we are now a little Thank bit you. out of the uh, schedule, but maybe still a quick question from Vitek. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you also for a nice talk. Now I have a question. Uh, uh, you know these, uh, you know th these are representations that do not occur. Okay, which are not uh, interval decompos decomposable. Mm -hmm. uh, did you check it for like you know for H one, H zero, H two, or it wasn't for specific homology degree? Uh, this is uh, showing only H one, and uh, we can only also on show H two. Okay, all right. Now, another thing is, did you do it for uh, in other dimensions like R10 or uh, it was on? Because of the uh, technical problems, mm -hmm. the technical problem means that, yeah, of course, we can do it by using the LIPS complex. Yeah. But uh, this is my guess. I think uh, the problem here is coming from the Euclidean space structures, I think. Mm -hmm. Because of this, and not the low dimension, by... not the low dimension of the ambient space. Well, at low the dimension, yeah. If I use a Lips complex, sometimes it doesn't reflect the Euclidean space structure. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so that's why I have not yet computed such a high dimensional situation using Lips complex. But uh, it will be also interesting to see. So I would like to see also, but uh, now I only focused on more Euclidean uh, space type uh, okay. structures. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you. No, 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 thank you very much. I think this is very important. Thank you, Yasu, once more for a very nice talk.